Uh, welcome everyone to our September 13th edition of the Scientific Governance and Risk Meeting with Stephen Becker. Uh, my name is Richard Brown. I'm the Technical Community Manager at MakerDAO. Um, I'm about to kick or hand things off to Stephen for an introduction and a recap, but I also want to point out that we have Soren Peter in the call with us today, uh, which is a great addition because um, in these meetings up until this point, we've been talking about um, what governance looks like, what risk looks like, and how things are going to, or how we're planning to implement uh, a lot of the backend mechanisms for when we have decentralized governance. And lo and behold, as of yesterday, we kind of do have some decentralized governance now, and, and that's a huge thing. It's a watershed moment in, uh, in the history of MakerDAO. And so in anticipation of uh, some questions we're going to start getting around uh, how does the voting mechanism work? What kind of votes are we having? What's the implication of these votes? Um, can we debate some of these votes? I think those are those are things that are going to start to arise more and more in these meetings. I think that Soren and members of his team are going to be joining us. So if anyone has any questions uh, about how the vote went or uh, some mechanisms of the new voting UI or something, uh, keep those in mind, maybe collect them. And towards the end of the meeting, uh, we can get Soren to, to do a little talk very brief talk about how uh, the vote went and maybe answer some of the outstanding questions. All right, I think that was it for my preamble. Stephen, uh, I'm going to hand it over to you now and you can teach us about money for a while. <laughs> I'll teach you about risk. You're going right, to have to enough. figure out about money yourself. Um, so firstly, um, my name is Stephen Becker uh, and I am the um, COO of MakerDAO or uh, president as well. Now, Previous week, we didn't have a, a community call. I apologize for that. Um, that wasn't that was something we we just simply couldn't avoid. But to to recap from you know where we previously left off, uh, the one thing that we we have done up to this point is we've defined all the first principle risks that are in the system, and we've also had a look at how each of the parameters that are set in the system look after those particular risks. So what are those parameters? Those parameters, as everyone knows, liquidation ratio, the debt ceiling, and the stability fee. The one thing we haven't got onto yet is the stability fee. But before we get onto that, I want to talk about correlation risk. And this is something I brought up in the, the last community call we had. But I think it's very important in terms of understanding not only the, the simple aspect of what diversification brings to a portfolio, but um, also how you go about building this collateral book. It's very easy to simply say something along the lines of, well, go and get all the collateral types that have very low diversification to each other, stick it into a portfolio, and you should be fine. It really doesn't work like that. There are so many constraints. The first one is obvious, is a business constraint. What is actually available and what can you include? What is good for the the blockchain economy, what actually will help facilitate growth on the blockchain economy. And that is important to understand because effectively that's what we do. That's what maker token governors do. They facilitate the economic growth on the blockchain. So it is extraordinarily important we understand how we're building our collateral portfolio with that in mind, as well as looking at the overall risk of the portfolios so uh, the overall risk of the portfolio and how that extends to protecting the integrity and stability of the of the system so that being said a very simple thing is let's have a look at correlation so everyone has a very good idea that if you've got a couple of assets that uh, are not correlated to each other you'll have a bit of a diversification benefit now in your general investment world in your traditional investment world Folks would look at this and say, well, if you've got a diversification benefit, we can increase the exposure in order to increase the return in the, um, uh, in the book for the portfolio. We don't do that. What we are doing is firstly looking after the safety of the system through the uh, book building of that collateral portfolio. It's very important to understand. It's very important to understand that that is the target, not maximizing return, max, sorry, minimizing risk, because that translates into stability and integrity. I can't emphasize that enough. So here's a quick question. 
for anybody that likes to would like to answer how would you go about deciding what collateral type to include into a portfolio what would be the very first step that you would think of uh, liquidity that's one the nice thing about liquidity and what is so important about liquidity is that it actually has far-reaching consequences liquidity is a result of two things one you need to have yeah liquidity and uh, David Utro says liquidity and non-correlation that's also important but the nice thing about that is that you guys are thinking very much in terms of the traditional investment management role those are the things that you really do need to consider only after understanding one very important premise that is what is the token what does it do why are we even worried about it what happens if we have cast your mind back to to eos we could have included eos as a collateral type but what was the consequence of it well eos is a network of itself that eventually went off ethereum and is operating on its own network so for all intents and purposes that was a short-term collateral type we've got to think now in terms of what are the grand amount of tokens out there and how do we categorize them why do we need to categorize them because in order to understand what those guys do in those categories will give us a very good a clear picture of their longevity on the blockchain further to that and this is what basically adds into the idea of, of liquidity which is really primary is how big are they what is the market cap this is essential because liquidity of market cap gives you a very good idea about how daily volume really represents the true trading that goes on with that particular asset in other words the price discovery um, that you see in the exchanges has to be either valid or there might be a component of it that is a bit of a wash trade and we've got to figure out which is which so that liquidity that is represented to us we have to be very careful and we have to be um, very particular on which collateral types we do want to include. So as, a, as an example of this, you may have a collateral type with a market cap of, let's say, $250 million. But its daily liquidity, or sorry, daily value traded might be in the region of half a million dollars. What does it say about that particular asset type? It seems that the, the organization has a lot of value, but that value has not yet translated into a fluid price discovery mechanism. That means that there's potential there. There's a possibility of looking at this particular uh, collateral type and saying this is definitely something we might want to include in our portfolio. But what is effectively holding it back? And what's holding it back is understanding why that market cap hasn't translated into a fluid sense of liquidity and that might be rooted in understanding primarily what that organization does what that organization's goals are what those are what that organization's fundamental aspects are as soon as you know that you can categorize the token or c categorize the asset clearly and it might give you a much better concept of why the liquidity looks the way it does on the flip side you might find there's a collateral type that has $50 million market cap, but its daily value that is traded is in the proportion of something like $25 or $30 million. Now, that immediately should ring some alarm bells. How does $50 million in issue translate into the super fluid liquidity of 50 to 60% of its own issue per day? Are now, there legitimate reasons why that would be the case? Well, this is the thing. The first thing you need to first the first thing you need to look at is what type of organization is it? What type of token is it? If you find that it is primarily a currency token, then it is feasible. It's possible to have that amount of turn, uh, um, turnover per day. But if it's not, then immediately there should be alarm bells. So again, we go back to the very important part of saying, well, what is this token that we're including? why is it important to understand these qualitative features because those qualitative features put everything else in context you we can um, quite easily go and find uh, um, if you go into coin market cap and just rank by daily value traded 
you'll find that there are actually quite a few tokens that have high daily value traded but have very small market cap. And when you have a look at them, you might find that they're, they're not currency tokens, they may be exchanges or they might be governance, sorry, utility tokens or governance tokens. And from that, you, know, you have to question what's going on there. A little bit of a deep dive helps. I mean, you're not gonna go all the way down to, to understanding the first principles of the organization, but just a, a general sense of what that organization does will put the liquidity in perspective. Now, given you have that liquidity, the next thing, and this is what David obviously uh, uh, mentioned, is liquidity and non-correlation. Now, we are in an industry that is effectively still in its infancy. I mean, it is nascent. So to expect to have these wonderfully huge, undiversified um, uh, asset types out there is a little bit of an ask. Everything is fundamentally rooted to the underlying native token that governs the network that they operate on. So consequently, everyone's seen what's happened with, with ETH, and you've seen what happens with all the uh, tokens that are you know, presently traded and are operating on Ethereum blockchain. It is a very natural thing to see. So we can't get away from the fact that diversification is going to be hard to find but we certainly are going to try because the first simple step is adding more collateral types but in order to do that we need to fundamentally go through what the qualitative aspects of the organization is and how it translates into liquidity and then basically have a look at what kind of correlation we have and what we can use um, to incorporate into the portfolio to improve the diversification benefit so, you know, given that, um, what would be, uh, well, what would someone suggest a, a good collateral type to be that we should add into the portfolio? Okay, actually, I just want to jump in with one quick question. I don't know mm -hmm. whether I'm off track or not, but is price volatility a factor or, or is that just sort of uh, an aspect of volatility, I guess? Well, when we include the, when we include the uh, collateral type into the portfolio, the first thing you need to look at is understanding what it is you're including and having a very good, at least as far as possible, a very good representation of its trading profile because the system uses price discovery as a, um, a point of recourse. So in other words, exchanges, secondary markets, price discovery, therefore liquidity is where the recourse of the system comes in. So that is our primary concern. So you could have something that is extraordinarily volatile, but has very good recourse, and you might want to include it. So how do you, how do you counter for that extraordinary uh, volatility? Well, you do so through the liquidation ratio. So you would want to include it, but the liquidation ratio might be 250%. And you find that if you've got high volatility and ample liquidity, you might have a high liquidation ratio and a high debt ceiling. But if that high volatility, which is usually the case, is associated with a lower market cap, um, a smaller amount of liquidity actually traded, then you'd have a much lower debt ceiling but an increased uh, uh, liquidation ratio. So you can start seeing how all these parameters start working for each other and, and against each other in order to represent that collateral type that we've included into the portfolio. So I'll take a, a break there for a second to see if there's any questions or any statements. I think most of the questions we have are for uh, later on in the meeting. So, okay. so to loop back to the, the question that you presented to the, the everybody who's watching, what, what collateral types do we suggest or what would we like to see? And I think that the obvious one that people generally leap to is uh, precious metal backed tokens. Mm. Well, in the broader aspect, you want to have a look at asset-backed tokens. I mean, that's effectively where your um, lower correlations, high diversification effects would be able to really come into play. So consequently, what you know, we are doing is trying to facilitate as much as possible the advent of these type of tokens. We are helping, we are partnering, and we are really uh, um, trying to source 
those organizations who primarily would like to um, issue asset-backed tokens because as we mentioned before and as you know rich just pointed out the the non-correlation there is a lot more um, evident and the inclusion of that into the correlate into the uh, collateral portfolio would be obviously much better uh, an inclusion but keep in mind that the way that you build this portfolio is not by just stipulating some massive debt ceilings and decide okay go for it let's see what happens you actually have to build this thing in a lockstep motion so if we do add a gold back token like there's a couple out there there's luster hello gold and and digix everyone i think is more of fay with digix including that into the collateral portfolio one would assume that the underlying spot portfolio is really where you the spot gold market would be where you'd find your risk parameters but unfortunately that's not the case what is the case is that you have to take into consideration the organization that translates the spot market into the crypto market that we use as a source of recourse now ultimately with an asset backed token you've got two forms of recourse the first is is clearly the the recourse to the secondary market so obviously if Digix is available you'll take the token and sell it off into the secondary market and obviously get the the realization that you want if that fails you can actually follow the recourse path all the way to the actual underlying gold but even though that gold is available to you it still does not represent the spot market um, a risk profile because you still have to go through the actual organization and how much the organization actually has available to you um, at the moment if we put in some massive amount for for gold it will not be reflective of the organizations we have in the collateral portfolio it's just more reflective of the underlying spot market they wish that they wish to eventually represent that's interesting that is, so uh, yeah I, I had a quick question about that uh so mm -hmm. is there uh like right now i imagine that there's no like actual efficient way to arbitrage between the gold spot market and like the digits, the digits market or like one of these uh, tokenized gold markets but do you see that in the future this issue would, will decrease like will go away yes the well one thing that you just mentioned right now about the arbitrage opportunity I and mean, if you if you do a little bit of homework you can have a look at the the gold futures market and how it works um, against the retail gold market which digits basically represents and there you've got something called basis risk and basis risk is where you actually will find your arbitrage opportunities you will have, find a a difference in price because obviously the spot gold that um, uh, um, the the gold contract on the CME represents is completely different to the underlying gold that you know Digix holds and that difference has its own distributional qualities and those that spread, which is effectively the basis, expands and contracts, and ultimately you can find your arbitrage opportunities if you wish. The anyone can do an arbitrage if you take into consideration the costs involved. And once those costs have been taken into consideration and you have a net profit, there's something available for you. It really is going about it really is all about going through the process and setting up the um, operational infrastructure to allow you to do this. So all of that is, is, is really available. But you know, going back to the likes of Digix, they've got such potential. It just really is a case of, like any other organization, getting adoption, getting traction, people seeing the value, getting more sense of how the, the underlying process works. How do you get uh, proof of asset? How is that justified? You, you do need a pioneer to show the way forward and then once it becomes clear how it works, everybody will, will be, you know, will jump on board. At this point in time, there are a lot of guys out there wishing to, to issue asset back tokens. There are really quite a lot. But at this point, what we see in front of us, there's only a few. And the few that we see don't have a massive issue. They don't have a massive market cap. And you know, consequently, I would include them in the portfolio, but I would include them with very low debt ceilings to be representative of the issue that they have. 
And once the adoption and the traction of that token takes place, it will be reflected in the debt ceiling, but reflected to the extent that it doesn't hurt the collateral portfolio as a whole. Those are interesting points. I think that people tend to oversimplify when they think, oh, it's this token is backed by gold, therefore it's secure and easy and the custody issues have been solved. But uh, it's obviously not that simple. It's we're not trading on the price of gold. We're trading on the ability for this organization to be effective and track the price of gold and custody the gold and offer an accurate or a reliable recourse method. So this a might be a good segue into just a, a thing that a lot of folks have habituated out and they have not considered. When you trade the gold futures, there is a gold integrity process in the background. It is extraordinarily formal. It is extraordinarily regulated. It's been around for a long time and has become efficient through iterations of processes. So much so that when you do your trades and if you happen to be, let's say for instance, longer futures contract in gold and you're getting closer to the settlement uh, date, you'll probably find that the broker that represents your futures will either close you out and say, listen, you're too close to the settlement, or you actually have to tell the broker, I wish to settle in gold. Now, the reason that that is so important, that little instruction, because if you don't tell the broker that you wish to settle in gold, he will close out, he or she will close out your contract. But if you do wish to, you are then part of the integrity process. You've got to figure out clearly how you're going to uh, take delivery of this gold. In other words, it's going to be in a warehouse somewhere. You're going to get a receipt. You're going to go to the warehouse with the receipt and say, that's my gold. Even that's not going to be enough for you to take the gold out, put it in your pocket and walk out the door. You need to have this whole transportation, insurance, all this infrastructure around it. Because as soon as you take that gold and put it in your pocket, theoretically speaking, it is out of the integrity process. You cannot put it back in again. It has to go all the way back to the beginning. The same thing with all these asset-backed tokens. They all have their own integrity processes that need to be put into place. But the blockchain is so much more efficient in doing that that you are going to find that we may find a lot of transfers from the traditional space onto the blockchain space once it becomes clear how all those background operations work more fluidly, more openly, and at the same time will give those efficiencies in terms of reduction in costs to the end user. I am a firm believer in that. At the moment, when you transfer money from your phone to someone else's phone, it seems like it's a simple thing. But I assure you, if you have ever looked at the operational processes of just a basic bank, the books on those processes are so thick, it's crazy. It's just been habituated out of your view. It's in the background, and it's taken hundreds of years to iterate into what it looks, what looks like an efficiency now. What is amazing about this blockchain space that we find ourselves in is that we can compress hundreds of years of iterations into an extraordinarily short space of time. Consequently, asset-backed tokens are going to be you know, incredibly important, and I think they're going to come in um, en masse. You're going to find an inflection point. It's not going to be this, this, this transition of you know, small amounts of guys trying to dominate the market. You're going to find... A, a, a critical point, a tipping point where the realization is there, the infrastructure is in place, and they're all going to be you know, beating down the door to get onto the blockchain. And the one thing I'm, I'm particularly happy about Maker is that we effectively facilitate that entrance. Does Maker require some more sophisticated uh, intermediaries? When So looking out a year or two, five years in the future, where potentially there's whatever it was called, 500 uh, gold-backed tokens out there. Will it be, are we hoping that there will be some kind of a clearinghouse mechanism or some kind of standard bodies that arise where uh, they sort of obfuscate these tokens away from the individual custody solution? We create those, or is it realistic that we create relationships with each one of the asset-backed tokens? I think we'll be creating relationships with each of the asset bag tokens and all of the individuals in their supply chain. It's going to be important to realize that you know previously you might have had, let's say, I'm just going to exaggerate for a moment here, um, you know, 150 steps in the process in the background. Blockchain should reduce that down to a case of being 30 steps. 
and fewer people involved as well, fewer organizations. And if those organizations you know, uh, use the blockchain to its full capacity, you're going to find that not only is it efficient, but the it's going to be efficient transfer of information as well, where you're going to have a balance of so many items that beforehand have been inefficient and have now been unlocked. And you're going to find that from a collateral portfolio point of view, the inclusion of those particular uh, uh, tokens, asset back tokens, will be the advent of something new. It will be the the initiation, the catalyst behind the tsunami that we expect. It just needs to go to show that one works efficiently enough and proficiently enough with enough transparency to allow the rest of the folks out there who are already working on it. They are, don't, don't get me wrong. There are so many folks working on this and they're ready. They just need to find that little signal, that little sign, a little ability or that platform to say, oh, this is the way I can go and do this. And they will be on the blockchain as soon as, really quickly, I suppose, is the, is the correct way of phrasing that. Steven, but, do, you, do you believe that the recourse process is going to be in and of itself uh, um, like a, a price discovery mechanism? Like even if there isn't a lot of liquidity on markets outside of, mm -hmm. like for example, like the auction uh, like mechanism, like is there going to, do you see that? Recourse is going to be a little industry all by itself. Uh, there is, uh, in my, one of my previous lives, one thing I like to do was combine capital market and insurance market together. Uh, collectively, it's called alternative risk transfer. And what you do is you try to find that wonderful spectrum of possibility uh, for people to interact with things that are very difficult to, to um, employ. So here, the first step we've taken is we've seen that secondary markets price discovery is going to be the root of our recourse. But that doesn't mean that's going to be the only root of recourse. You can use a, an entire sub-industry just to talk about what recourse means. In other words, there's an insurance aspect there. There's a risk transfer aspect there. You could create tokens that actually take on that risk transfer and then uh, deliver itself to the blockchain for people to actually participate in that risk transfer process. So I'll give you a simple case. You might find that there are certain tokens that have insurance baked into their token. Now that insurance might be initially from the traditional space, but it, eventually you'll find that the insurance will be on the blockchain as well. So you will find that there are organizations that represent backing, that represent you know, last uh, um, line of, of defense and being available to, to folks to add into their portfolio, take exposure to. This also goes back to looking at you know, a DAO. A DAO for all intents and purposes may be a new legal representation, which means that capital structure is going to be so granular that it will represent so many things. One aspect of it might actually be the ability to insure itself, to look after itself. And that can be stripped out and obviously put onto, onto an exchange or made available to, for folks to, to participate in. The point I'm trying to make here is that recourse by itself could actually be an entire sub-industry, very much like um, uh, you know, data provision. Data provision and cleaning is already, a, a, albeit a small, but it is a sub-industry. How do you go about making sure that you have representative data? So all of these aspects that we're talking about ultimately are going to to form new verticals that people can participate in. But what is so exciting about this is that the granularity of these verticals are going to be such that's never been seen before. That's what, that's what is inspiring me about the blockchain. Everywhere I look, where you try to create these wonderfully and what they used to call exotic derivative structures are going to be just very uh, um, basic and very clear and very well understood structures on the blockchain because everyone's going to be able to see what's going on as opposed to exotic derivative structures which by its name defines you know you know how scary they sound exotic means they combine a whole bunch of things together you don't understand derivatives let's not go there but in this space you can actually say do you just want to participate in a vote there's a token for you do you want to participate in an insurance that backs a certain product. Here's the token for you. It becomes very specific and very simple. If you think about it, make a DAO, 
has one very simple objective supply a stable coin nothing else but if you have a look at all the things that go around it in order to make it work you know obviously the complexity comes in once everyone has habituated out that complexity like we have done in our normal lives with respect to transfer of money when it, when it comes to all our basic uh, uh, um, needs that we do on a daily basis you'll find the same thing occurring so naturally you'll need that transactional value and that's where we obviously make it our steps in to be able to facilitate growth on the on the blockchain and at the same time facilitate the transactional aspect of it goes hand in hand and that collateral portfolio that we're building is in essence all those new entrants that wish to come on to, to the blockchain. All right, As, sorry, I, I, I want to cut you off here before you, that's, that was like the one mind blowing takeaway of this meeting, I guess. I'm gonna have to ruminate on that one for a bit. That was really cool. Uh, we're, we're coming up at the halfway mark and I, I wanted, before we hand it over to Soren, I want to ask you a question about a collateral type that's that's sort of been we, we coyly talk about it in a coy manner every once in a while, but I want to see what your thoughts are on this. So a, a collateral type that's simply a fiat based token. So when uh, new stable coins come along like true USD or, or uh, the new Winkle boss versions, we um, tend to say, well, that's great. It's, that's more fuel for the, the maker to fire and we could use that as a collateral type. But can you talk a bit about what it looks like to have a, potentially a stable fiat backed token as a collateral type in our ecosystem? Whether that makes sense or not. Is that for me? Yes. Yeah. Oh, yeah. Well, the first thing that is important is that we distinguish between, everyone has a very good idea about the differences between these stable coins. And the one thing that I would suggest is that if we do include a stable coin into our collateral portfolio, it's got to be of the IOU type. The reason, because it's very simple. IU types are off-chain. And if they're off-chain, they're effectively an asset-backed token. I mean, you know, it's great that they have a money market fund. They could be US dollar deposits, whatever the case may be. The point being is that they're ultimately just an asset-backed token. So they fall into the same category as gold and as you know anything else. So recourse is the critical component. Though. Recourse is always the critical component. The reason that we don't, we wouldn't want to use certain stable coins is because the recourse mechanism in the fine print says we may not be willing to uh, pay you the amount on delivery of a token that by itself just says there is no recourse but there are certain stable coins that we would want to use because there is very clear recourse into um, the underlying funds or the underlying um, constructs that they've used so that is important would I use stable coins that are on the blockchain? That one, in other words, if there was another decentralized stable coin, or if there was a, an algorithmic, I suppose it's also decentralized uh, uh, stable coin, I would be hesitant to use that one. The reason being is that there is an unfortunate, unfortunate systemic risk where we could inadvertently use something from their construct and they could use something from ours so what we do is we create in this feedback loop and everybody knows what happens when you bring a microphone too close to a speaker everything starts really wailing loud and things break and it doesn't happen because you expect it it happens because of your proximity a very simple um, example of this would be let's pretend there's a a um, new decentralized uh, um, stable coin out there let's call it coin A and coin A takes the same thing as we do they take collateral and they, they supply their their coin now what happens if we just cut out all the collateral and just say what it what what happens if we take A and put it into our collateral portfolio and then we supply Dai and then Dai gets placed into their collateral portfolio and they supply A and this virtuous circle carries on until obviously the limits are reached now that's not too bad but effectively what that does is that it breaks your um it breaks your risk management capability because when you start bringing in other tokens it doesn't become very clear that you're actually using a in your collateral portfolio you might take in eth and 
supply dye, then use dye to go purchase collateral B, and B is placed with them, and they draw A. A gets used to purchase ETH, and it gets placed with us. You can see how that virtue circle then becomes a lot more um, um, opaque, but yet it's still existent. And if that thing carries on, effectively what happens is someone else is eating into your, into your collateral portfolio risk assessment. You actually create a systemic risk there. But, so, doesn't, that, but doesn't that carry to like the individual user? Not for like the system itself. So doesn't that argument apply to even like the current? Uh, well, no, never mind. But like, doesn't the user carry that risk, not the system? Well, the user carries that risk, but to a certain extent, what you've got is an overexposure. Like, I'll give you a very simple example. Let's say we, um, you know, stablecoin A and ourselves, we both like Digix, right? We want to use Digix in our in our uh, portfolio, in our collateral portfolio. Now, Digix at the moment has got a. Um, I stand to be corrected. Let's say a, a three million. Uh, uh, market cap right now. I'm of the opinion you shouldn't be more than 20% of that that issued market cap. So I would have a debt ceiling of 600,000. But to, but uh, stablecoin A, they decide that you know they don't like that sort of premise. They like to just use the full um, you know market cap. They've decided that their debt ceiling is three million. So what actually happens is that if Digix is used, we might get to our debt ceiling of 600. But you might find that through the use of the other guys, we inadvertently are including Digix exposure into our collateral portfolio through other collateral types. So there's a little bit of a systemic risk that you've now overexposed yourself to a particular um, uh, collateral type that was outside of your control. And you couldn't see it because you don't know where else it was used as a collateral type. So for all intents and purposes, if we are using 20% of Digix and Stablecoin A is, is using the remaining 80%, that basically means two organizations have locked up the entire uh, uh, Digix supply. And if Digix decides to, if Gold decides to take a bit of a, a fall tomorrow and all these CDPs get bitten at the same time, who is going to buy 100% of the issue of Digix? Because you basically have just cornered the market and you've closed the market. So this is a very, I okay, guess, an extreme edge case, but it's just highlights the thought experimenting else, that you could have this sort of uh, uh, systemic process that could, you know, unduly affect your, your own portfolio. So it is important to be very clear about who you want to include into your portfolio, either directly or indirectly. I think the simplest case right now is to say directly, I wouldn't include certain folks that are very much representative on the um, on, on the blockchain that are stable coins. But ironically, the ones that are representative off are effectively asked back tokens. Those ones I'll be you know, happy to include. Not to say I'm ruling it all out. It really just boils down to further understanding what the other stable coin is doing. If you get a very good sense of what they're doing and you can see it's orthogonal to what you're doing, it's a very good thing to include. But if you find that it's very much parallel to what you're doing, you're just sort of doubling down your exposure. And you've got to be a little bit careful of that. OK, that's, that's interesting. We're, we're coming up on the 45 minute mark. So uh, one last question for you, Stephen. And I think that we'll get Soren to talk a bit about the, the governance UI. Uh, Jordan asked, does the risk team have preferred suggested risk parameters ready to discuss or vote on for multi-collateral DAI? Have you guys thought that far ahead yet? Uh, we've got a, a list of collateral. And um, obviously, I need to make sure that we are we, we give those organizations heads up first as to the fact that we would like to include them before we tell everyone else. Because you know it really boils down to just a, a sense of protocol, good manners, and decorum. Um, that makes for a much better industry. So we're in that process right now. In terms of risk parameters, yeah, they pretty much are, are attached. Um, one thing we can discuss, and one thing is really open for debate, is how do you go about, if you, Bit of a tricky question, but think about this. Which risk parameter should you calculate first? Debt ceiling. One would think. Stability fee? Okay, you can't just guess now. I could just list them all off. <laughs> you can just list them all. Yeah, go one and three. But the point being here is that if you think about it carefully, you actually have to start with a fixed point. And that fixed point has to be your liquidation ratio. You actually have to say, given the liquidation ratio, what do the other two look like? 
most people would think, you know, given the debt ceiling, oh, why can't you do it separately, independently? Well, in order to understand what we're doing, you need to see it independently as on a per token basis. But as soon as you start including it into a collateral portfolio, you need to actually start thinking about it in terms of how the whole thing needs to be constructed so that you're not overexposing yourself to any one particular concentration of risk. That's an interesting point you raised, though. Like uh, when we add people to our collateral portfolio, portfolio, we're potentially affecting their business. If everything works out the way that we hope, we'll be exactly. affecting their business. So it's exactly it's uh, just uh, good courtesy to let them know and give them a, a chance to communicate with that beforehand. All right, uh, thank you, Stephen. That was that was amazing as usual. Um, Soren, did you want to uh, talk just a little bit about how things went with the? The voting well uh, uh, anyone uh, uh, first of all I want to see the voting is still open for another two days so all of you out there who has MKI and hasn't voted uh, go on and and cast your vote because as you said rich this this is really a big moment for for the governance of, of the maker and we we are fully committed to move toward decentralized governance and uh, this this is kind of a, a way that Nobody, as far as I'm aware, have threat before, so we have to learn along the way. We kind of, we, we are aware we're not here with this uh, version of it, and uh, there are a lot of things to take into consideration. For the first one here, we really kind of focused on making sure that, that people shouldn't have their uh, wallet where they keep the MKR exposed more than, than uh, for a minimum uh, time. So, so we introduced what we call a, a voting proxy contract, where you actually can specify a hot wallet to use for voting. So you only need to have your cold wallet connected uh, when you create the link to the this hot wallet. And this hot wallet, all it can do is it can move the maker into the voting contract and lock it up because you need to have it locked up to be able to vote. And it can move it back to the cold wallet. It cannot pull it back to itself. It cannot send it anywhere. So you simply need to take your cold wallet and, and connect it when you set up this. Uh, the, the cost is that the first time you come into the system, you have to go through this four transactions setup process to have all of this set up. Um, but uh, that actually also enables us to kind of support two kind of voting systems because uh, as Stephen has talked about in the prior editions here, we have to, uh, those uh, what we call governance votes, which is to get resolution or symbolic votes, you know, where people just indicate uh, what their opinion is. And then we have the executive votes where what happens is actually resulting in direct changes to the system. Uh, and uh, the governance votes, that it can be a different ways of voting, but it's simply poll voting where you are, for example, either can vote yes or no or something like that. Whereas the executive vote is uh, what we call approval voting, where you uh, have the ability to, to put your vote on something and then it stays on that. And that actually means that if you want to support the stability of the system, you can simply let your vote stay on the last thing that was voted through because then that vote will be a kind of a do nothing vote. So you just vote for keeping uh, the system as it is. Uh, but again, it's two different voting systems. And to be able to have your make account uh, in both voting systems, we actually then use the, uh, the voting proxy to support that as well. So uh, uh, now we have kind of a concept for this. There are obviously ways we can improve it, for example, even though it improves security. Some people simply want to use the same wallet that they keep their maker in for voting, and we will extend the support so that's also possible going forward. And obviously, we want to kind of add uh, a lot of uh, additional features going forward based on the feedback we get from you voters. Uh, there was this question early on that uh, is it really true that it's only 300 and 50 maker that has been cast votes for us so far. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Uh, I I certainly hope uh, that they will get a, a lot more people out there. Uh, but you know, at least this is a chance for people that disagree with uh, the foundational principles 
to get out there and vote against them. And you know, if you don't do anything, that's also from my point of view uh, a way to support uh, the principles. So, so yeah, there's a lot of interesting signaling happening right now. We're we're learning some things about how voters behave, and I think it's it's early days to come to any conclusions, but. I think it's inter it'll be interesting to watch how many people wait and see, how many people do last minute votes, uh, the behavior of the large holders, because I don't think we've seen any large holders interact with the system yet either. So. Well, I also, I have to actually say that <laughs> there is a bug in the system. So if you try to transform all the 999 maker uh, into the voting proxy, uh, there actually is a, a bug that obviously is fixed. But if you're one of those out there with more than that, you can simply take them in chunks and just transfer 999 and then top up with additional 999. And it will just take a little bit more. But uh, you know, don't let that keep you back. I'm glad somebody else pointed that out because I would not have stumbled on that bug myself, unfortunately. <laughs> um, well, George Another question, he says, while your vote stays on a certain vote like you're talking about right now, then does your maker have to stay locked in the voting proxy indefinitely? It, uh, it actually stays in the contract that we call DS chief, uh, which which uh, actually let me let me much real quick now uh, because um, then I can uh, show you a figure. Uh, so what you see here is really down in the uh, lower right corner. There is what we call the chief, which is the approval voting system. And then there is, is the polling system. And, uh, and to have your vote count, you have to, uh, to lock the maker up in the chief, which then will provide IOU tokens that are being locked up in the polling system. So, so that's, it's, it's just to make sure that, that you, uh, I don't, misrepresent anything your maker is locked up in the ds chief contract which is um is is audited uh, by uh, by external auditors as well uh, before i stop sharing screen are there any further questions to this figure here okay i'll stop sharing any other questions yeah, I had a question about whether I'm able to uh, proxy two cold wallets to a single hot wallet. Let's say if my friend wants to give me his maker votes. Well, uh, so that is that a kind of delegation you're after? Yeah. Yeah, I I think that that needs another solution because your 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 body really needs to trust you if if he just. Uh, it just gives that. Otherwise, we would not need to have some kind of bookkeeping system for what wallets you should transfer it back to. So, uh, so uh, I I don't that think that's sense. the way forward. Uh, is that something that's but, on the roadmap, Soren? Is vote delegation something we've been thinking about? <laughs> uh, definitely, it has been discussed quite a while. There's there's different ways of delegation. There's the simple delegation where people simply let others vote on their behalf, and the next thing is actually more like yeah voting for somebody to do make certain decisions on your behalf right so uh, you know and and again all of this is something that the community need to chime in on and, and we need to to find out what's needed and, and when to do it so it's yeah. it's not like it's coming this year i don't foresee that but i think it ties back to what you said earlier it's uh, the decentralized governance is a, is a long road comprised of many baby yeah. steps and i think this is a good first step Absolutely. Okay, I think that um, that might have been all. Unless Soren, do you have any in, it was sort of overarching lessons or or comments that you wanted to make about the system or what you thought about it? Uh, well, uh, you know, we I, I will just say we 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 have tested the, what we have now with users, and and uh, we certainly are aware that that there's a lot of usability things that. Some of them are just really hard to, to do something about as long as you have to have transactions that go through it. But, you know, even longer term, obviously, we could also think about solutions where you don't have to have each and everything go to a, uh, down to a transaction on the mainnet. Uh, so, again, lots of things we need, need to think about. We also need to understand a lot more about 
MKR owners, uh, what kind of wallets do they use? Uh, do they have other needs like do they trade off or do they just stick stick all their maker into a safe? Uh, and and we want we will go out and try to pursue the information in a more systemic manner going forward. Yeah, I guess it's just a matter of uh, aggregating uh, information we learn off the first books to figure out what the next books are going to look like. I don't think we yeah, have and, and like probably research. also do a survey or, or something like that. Yeah. All right. Well, it's been, I think, well, from my limited perspective of, of me on the internet, it looks like it's been a, a great success so far. So congratulations to your team for pulling that together. It's Thank the you. first representation of sort of a, a real um, version two app that's come out of the MakerDAO ecosystem as well. Something with a real UI, real workflow, real explanations and videos and all the rest. So it's very exciting to see this thing in action. Congratulations. And, the, um, and that esteemed gentleman that we've just all heard from, Soren Peter, was primary and paramount to getting all of this together in order for us to be able to do something that Rich pointed out as a watershed moment. So my hat's off to, to Soren Peter specifically. Thank you very much, sir. Thanks, thanks a lot, Stephen. I should note that it's really a, a great, great team effort by a lot of people at the Mega team, but, but thanks nonetheless. Yeah, great team for sure, uh, it, but it takes a certain amount of dedication to pull a team of rock stars together and get them to <laughs> release something on a deadline. So congratulations for that. <laughs> thanks. Much appreciated. You guys are awesome. Thank you. I think we might have another question. Oh, Jordan. You can always count on Jordan. So will there be a forum component to the governance dashboard anytime soon? Uh, it's it's certainly on the roadmap. Uh, and, and you know, again, the thing is, you know, is it a question of meeting users where they are or try to move them over, you know? Uh, and, and I don't have the answer there, but it's certainly on the roadmap. So we can have also, there was somebody on Rocket Chat that mentioned, you know, when people won't know, it would be really nice to know what they object to. And I, I fully agree. So uh, so that's uh, that's certainly a thought. But again, I also think it's a very important consideration that we don't create a very, very fancy forum that no one but cares to, to be in. So, yeah. Yeah, I think from the community perspective, I shared the same opinion, Soren. I think that creating a venue and then uh, pushing people into that venue has very mixed success in my in my experience. So we kind of have to follow the crowd on this one so we can make some suggestions, but we'll go where the people are at. And once we reach a certain level of interaction, then we can start thinking about specific uh, forums for debate. I, I'd like to turn this forum into to one of the top level lo locations where we can discuss issues. Uh, Reddit obviously is going to be secondary. Uh, we'll have a specific chat a channel in our rocket chat to discuss governance soon once we reach a volume of, of activity. And I think that after that, we'll, we'll start thinking of next steps. But creating a forum from scratch, I think, is have, having gone down this horrible road in the past, it's, it's a, not an insignificant amount of time and effort required to do something like that. And, we have a critical path at MakerDAO that we need to stay focused on. So we'll see how things shake out. Uh, David, do you want to ask your question out loud or do you want me to read it for you? <clears throat> Which question? Uh, this means the only thing I can do with Maker is vote basically no. Oh, no, no, no. That, that was actually part of the conversation I was having in the chat. I was trying to understand whether... So, so Vamsi told me that I need... It's only one hot wallet per one cold wallet. So if I was to be delegated my friend's maker, the way he would do that currently is that he would give me access to only the hot wallet. So he'd set up the voting proxy himself. And then he could just simply, you know, give me the, the, the seed phrase for like his hot MetaMask wallet. And then I would be able to vote with his maker and my maker with two separate hot wallets. Yeah. I think, yeah, I think we're going to be discovering that people are coming up with some edge cases that we didn't uh, consider because the uh, opportunity to use a hot wallet and trading of, or moving around of the IOU tokens. And then uh, I think that opens up the door to some things that we haven't anticipated yet. So I think there might be some, some clever. Some de in. Definitely some good hackathon material in there. Yeah, precisely. Like there's an opportunity for dApps to actually you know, abstract away the voting mechanism. So it's, it's terrifying and interesting to see what people might come up with. But... 
All right, I think uh, well, we're down to one minute, so that was perfectly timed. So uh, thanks to everybody for coming to the call. I think it was enormously successful. Uh, Stephen, great stuff as usual, a lot to think about. I don't think I've quite figured it all out yet, so more questions for next week. Uh, thanks, Soren, for the update on the, the voting mechanism as well. So I think that's it for us. Thanks Thank you, folks, for joining. Bye. I appreciate it. Yeah. Bye, guys. Thanks, you guys. Bye-bye.